Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be covering everything that's EB1 questions. If you have questions, you can go ahead and do them live. What we'll do is, Alexis, maybe as we go, if we see it's relevant to the topic we're talking about, we'll answer them as we go. And if not, we can leave a couple for the end. Um, but let's sort of get into it. Let's talk about just generally what is an EB1A petition for permanent residency and how many steps does it take? I mean, uh, EB1A, one of my favorite visas, really. Same. Mostly because you can self-petition. Basically, you as as the foreign national, you are the petitioner, self-petitioner. You're the applicant, right? And it's great. You don't need a sponsor. You don't need a job offer, though, if you have one. We surely include it. Really, what they're going to examine by they, I mean, USCIS, the Department of uh, Homeland Security, immigration officer, they're going to assess your extraordinary ability. Now, what does that mean? We'll go through that now. But in general terms, it's a talent-based visa. Are you great at what you do? Are you recognized for what you do? And this is going to cover the arts, sciences, business, education, and of course, uh, uh, athletics. I, I really love it. I do too. And so one of the, I like to always point out from the beginning, this will lead to permanent residency in the United States for you and for your immediate family, for spouse and minor children. Um, it's going to be a two-step process. So the first step is essentially showing how you qualify, which is what we're going to go into a lot of detail in today. And that's, you know, how you qualify, why you are in fact extraordinary in your field. And then the second phase is where now that immigration has said you qualify, we're doing sort of the administrative part, the fingerprints, the um, the vaccines, all of those things that can be done either abroad or in the U.S. So it will lead to permanent residency for everybody. Um, importantly, stage one, which we're going to talk about now, doesn't immediately give you a legal status. So some, that's that's why it's important to have an attorney, because this is really a multi phase process and you need to be able to do that and figure that out in accordance with your travel plans, your family's travel plans, your needs for work and school and all of that. So we would be here to help you. If you guys ever want a personal consultation, you can obviously reach us, but let's go a little bit and let's go a little just generally, what are, how do I qualify? What's the number one? And then what are the 10? I mean, the number one, what we all want, the one type achievement. Rarely do our clients have it because really it's a extremely high standard. I don't think it's necessary, but a one-time achievement, you're, you're talking about international award, uh, a Grammy, for example, an Emmy, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on the arts now, but though that's really what they want. They want what's the most reputable prize in your line of work, in your area, in your field. That's really what they want. A, a Pulitzer, for an example, Olympic medal. I'm sorry. Olympic medal. An Olymp. Oh well, yeah, Olympic medal. Now we could play a little bit with that. You know, maybe there's maybe a Pan American game, right? We can. There's a little bit of flexibility, and and each industry will have maybe more options than others. But we're talking about creme la creme, top of the top. What is it that that you need? Um, if it's a nationally recognized award. You know, not, not, not so much, not so much. It's going to be international. You're completely yeah. right. You know, so you get, you, you as the individual will know better than us, but we'll do our research, but that's the conversation we have when we first have the consultation, you know, we're assessing your case. We want to get to know more about your profile to be realistic, you know, which route are we going to take? And, um, but that one time achievement, some people do have it and, and it's great if you have it because then you're one and done basically. And, and we have to establish everything that we need to establish about the award, that you received it, not just a photo, right? Where's the medal? Where's the certificate? Where's an official letter? Where's the press that recognize that you received this award? Uh, let's provide information to make it apparent. I know sometimes it's obvious. Let's make it crystal clear to this officer what this award is about, why you received it, and you as an individual. So if... You're an actor in a film, and the film wins uh, an Academy Award for, I don't know, best sound, best motion picture. That's not attributed to exactly you as an individual. Exactly, exactly. So that's going to be 
if you are Adele and you have a Grammy, you can automatically apply for an EB1, you can self petition and you can get your permanent residency. That's obviously not everybody. And we want to make sure we tell you the grand majority of our clients do not fall into that category, but it's good to know because listen, we've had a couple Latin Grammy winners that they have in fact had their Latin Grammy. It was in their name and we were able to do the one time achievement for everybody else who does not have an Oscar or Grammy, an EB1 is still possible. An EB1, everyone sort of sells it as like the Einstein residency. Not necessarily. If you got a clever attorney, we, we can make it, we're mo malleable and we can make it work, which is what the examples we're gonna give today on like weird cases that have sort of won and what we've been able to do with them. So just generally, um, if you are not Einstein, you can qualify for the EB-1 if you can show that you qualify for at least three of 10 categories. So immigration provides 10 categories. If you can show that you meet three, you can qualify for an EB-1 permanent residency. I think let's go as a starting point. Um, I always like to start with press. Are you okay with starting with that one? Sure. Let's start with press. Why not? All right. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about press. Press is, so Alexis made a wonderful distinction, which is, you always have to look at when an award or press or a recognition, something is recognizing you as a person or it's recognizing your work. Those two things are both useful, but you're going to use them in different ways and in different categories. Right. So let's say you are, you know, and it could be anyone. It could be uh, arts, businesses, sciences. Let's say there's a press article about you and it is hey, we're going to do an interview with Alexis who just starred in Titanic, or we're going to go ahead and do an interview with Alexis who is, you know, headlining the major restaurant that just opened in Miami, or we're going to do an interview with Alexis who is um, one of the top scientists leading the way for nanotechnology. Man, I, I'm really impressed with all of that. <laughs> okay, yeah. So anything about sort of you and any profile about you, anything in the press, press can be on the web it could be in a newspaper it could be in a magazine preferably not blogs though there may be a way to sort of sell it and show that it's a real real blog and not just sort of someone who who isn't as well known yeah. but that's the type of press you want to show and for the press category the other important thing is showing that this press medium reaches people so in my blog example it can't be pepito's blog that has two viewers and it's his mom and his sister it has to be a blog, a, for instance, a blog that's very well known, who, what, where. This is considered, you know, a huge fashion blog. It's sort of reached its pinnacle where it's no longer just a regular blog. It is a fashion news um, medium, right? It is it is renowned within the industry. People yeah. are consider that to be a reputable source for fashion news and information. So that, that's what they're looking for Yeah, at exactly. that point. So for press, you want to show both. So you have been spoken about in the press and the press that's talking about you is recognized in your country or in your industry or in your field. Um, what's the number? Magic number. I always have a magic number when it comes to EV ones. Let's say four to five, ideally four to five articles. I've done less. I've done a lot more. Right. But four to five articles is like, wow, you are really, really perfect for this EV one category. Absolutely. And, and, you know, something that we need to consider, you know, there's there's the old school form of press, magazines, newspapers. That's good. That's all well and dandy. Uh, maybe even the suggested preference. Online publications of the same. So Vogue magazine, Vogue online, uh, New York Times newspaper, New York Times online. They're both reputable, right? It's the the publication has the esteem and, and that will be major media. Also consider like a blog that Stephanie mentioned, TV, radio interviews. I mean, I think that has a value as well. How do you document it? Well, let's take some screenshots. Let's also include a letter from the someone from the production, someone from the network, just uh, confirming that it took place. And if the officer really wants, and, and I suggest that we include it, a transcript. Okay. Because the officer wants to know what was spoken about. Because if it's an interview of what a great uh, athlete you are, right? So Stephanie gave me a bunch of hats. What a great athlete I am. But I'm presenting the case as a, as a producer. Well, then the articles and the press need to be about my work as a producer. 
I have someone whose case I've worked on, a uh, former Olympic athlete, uh, about 30, 40 years ago. We went ahead and did the case for them, but something completely different in the area of business. So can I include the Olympic medal? Sure. Does it matter? Not even a little bit. So we have to keep that in perspective. That's why it's very important that it be about you, the work that you've done, the success you've had within the field that we're documenting. And I mean, there are ways to incorporate other areas. There's flexibility. We, we're creative on our end. Uh, but there has to be some sort of connection. If I could say just one more tip. If you are currently trying to make your EB1 case, let's say you are 01 and you're like, okay, eventually I want to hit permanent residency. If you have the option to do both, let's say, you know, like El Comercio approaches you and they're like, hey, we want to do a YouTube interview with you or we want to do a written interview. Always go with the written. It's going to be better for immigration if you're working on your press now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, aside from press, uh, if you want to go back to the awards, since that's kind of what we opened up with, there's the national or international award. So there, there's another option, and that's if you have a uh, you've received a, an award, what they'll call a lesser award, for excellence in the field. So think of, hey, I won a, uh, I don't know, let's say a bodybuilding competition. And but it's the national one, not not uh, it's maybe hosted by the IBFF, um, IBBF, sorry, and, or just the country, right? Just the whoever, whatever entity is responsible for that. Let's say the North American Bodybuilding Federation, just to use an example. Mm -hmm. Well, that national recognition and receipt of the award, maybe I place top five, top ten. We can use that, and that will qualify as one of the 10 criteria that award mind you what's a national award there's so many competitions that can take place um if your work is in the field of arts and you're uh, uh i don't know let's say you do graffiti murals so you're more of a pop artist a contemporary art let's call it there might be several competitions maybe hundreds. Well, what are the 10 most reputable? I mean, film festivals, for example. I mean, that's Love. a good that's example. A There's so many film festivals, but some are more important than others, but some are kind of on the same scale, right, Stephanie? We, As long as we can document that it's nationally recognized or internationally recognized. So they're taking people from across the United States, just to use that as an example, or your home country, if you're from Canada, if you're in Germany, if you're in the UK and those film festival, Edinburgh Film Festival, one of the biggest ones in the UK, not the biggest one, but it's a big one. Um, Cannes in France, right? I was about to say France, sorry. But those are ones that are reputable. And you might even say international. Maybe not the biggest, but it has that recognition. That's what you're looking for in that category. So you won the award, just the awarding uh, organization might not be the highest one within the industry. Right. Uh, sometimes if you're a member of an ensemble and they won the award, we're going to argue it there. Yeah. But what if you're a band member and, you know, the, the entire band received the award? I mean, we've made the argument. It's attributed to your work. You're a central part to that band. And so that's how we try to connect you. Now, if, if you're an athlete, well, how about a coach? Even better. The athlete won the award. Well, you as the coach who are, you're doing the training with this person. You're teaching them how to, you're observing them. You're just doing all the preparation with them. That award that the athlete won is attributed to the coach. And yeah. that's a big thing. So there are many ways to maybe frame it within the, within the category of, of in this case, nationally or internationally recognized award, but we just got to figure out what's your role in it and what is the organization about or what esteem have they received? How reputable are they? Exactly. Exactly. So let's just drop a couple more examples here. Um, we've done some with journalism awards. So for instance, this person was like, it was the national award of journalism presented by their home country or presented by like the 
the Union for Journalists. That was a winning award. We have used, um, in, let's get a little funky, right? Because arts and music is a little uh, self-explanatory. We've done uh, award for like best teeth and it was given to an orthodontist and it was done by like the Orthodontist Association of X country. Uh, we've done, um, High rank equestrian of the year, highest yeah. rank poker player of the year, or like there's one where um, in Latin America, I know we've done one where it's the baseball players and they're ranked by their own, by themselves, with, between themselves. So there's this award of like, amongst other baseball players, we vote this guy as the best. Things like that have worked. Absolutely. I mean, if, if you want to talk about the sciences, right? So uh, Kesa had um, previously- Best research project, sorry. So it, ophthalmologist. So she had two awards. One was uh, we considered an international award because the there a conference and it's hosted by the international organization. And at this conference, uh, the client was recognized for for her research, right? And and the breakthrough her research led through in the field of ophthalmology. And so she had that personal award. And then I think probably this was initially, uh, but in her home country, the organization in charge, the society in charge of ophthalmology recognized her with the best research paper of the year. Now, it was open to all professionals across the country, so you, you weren't limited to one region. It was for professionals, so it wasn't limited to students, right? We have to make that distinction, though being a student alone isn't a bar. We just want to make sure that it's open to people beyond those who are just students. And and that research paper is recognized as being, or the, the award for her research recognized as a national award. Um, athletes, this happens a lot of times where it's more of a ranking system than just win or loss, and then you get points. And so, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're, you're moving up in the points and scale. So using uh, equestrians it happens a lot though they do win uh races uh bodybuilders it happens uh, a lot um i know a lot of a lot of sports individual sports are like that like anything in track and field sometimes that might happen where maybe you're placing third and fourth place or fifth place but points wise you might be in second um and or maybe you're better in one area than the other so uh you're really great at the 100 meter sprint not so much the 400 meter. And so that's fine. Let's go and focus in on that ranking, that national ranking. That is really important and which might lead to an international ranking or maybe. Let's, let's go because we could go on this forever. And I already yeah, noticed right. the time. <laughs> I, know. I, just, I just love this visa so much because you can do so much with it. It's malleable. It is. It is very much. All right. Let's jump into judging. Judging for me. I, I know Alexis agrees. Judging for me has to be one of those that if you're working on an even one petition, find it, find it. It has to be one of the categories we argue because it is just such an easy category to win. So the idea is you have to show that you have participated as a judge in an, a competition or a contest in your industry, but evaluating the work of others in a field that's either the exact same field or a very similar field and that you were chosen to be on this panel because of your career, right? So um, an easy example for educators is you're allowed to judge thesis works. The university asks you to judge thesis works. You're evaluating the work of can uh, PH candidate students, right? Great. Um, an easy one for the film and television industry. If you're looking to better your evidence for an EB1, approach film festivals. They're always looking for people to participate as judges. Go up to them and say, hey, listen, can I act as a judge for the next event, the next edition? Yeah. Do that for film festivals. In music, uh, battle of the band competitions, talent competitions, all of those to participate as a judge. My tip there would be try not to judge um, student competitions. Try to judge more like elite level. For instance, the judging the thesis works works because it's people who are like, you know, doctoral candidate level, master's candidate level. It's not small students. So if you're doing a music competition of like three-year-olds, it's going to be very different to a music competition of university level. Um, judging. Talk to me about judging a little bit, Alexis. What do you want to add? Ju judging such an easy category, in my opinion. And, and, and I think Stephanie says exactly what it is that we need. Make sure that what who you're judging 
uh, is in the professional, let's say, area or somewhat akin to that. That's all. I mean, the organization could be the, the event could be a smaller event. Doesn't need to have that same level of recognition. If it does, great. Uh, but we do want to document that it occurred. We do want to show that th there is something, some buzz around the event, but not necessarily does it, it doesn't necessarily need to be at that level of nationally recognized. Someone in the field of business, uh, maybe tech, let's say, we're thinking of you know one of those hackathons. I know those are very popular. Yeah. Great one. I mean, I love those. Uh, most cities have them. Um, if there's something regarding startups, so, you know, seeds where maybe they're kind of, uh, you know, everyone's putting in a project to get some of the feed money and there's awards at the end. There are judges they're selecting. So you, as someone who's an expert recognizing the field, can partake in that. And I'm sure it's very easy. Um, if you know, if you're an athlete, sometimes there could be issues there, right? It's hard to say uh, I'm both referee and athlete. Well, maybe you could do it at the collegiate level or instead of at a national competition, at a state competition or provincial competition. So there might be some flexibility there. Maybe you're a coach, um, not coaching the national team, but you're part of the panel, the group, that's selecting those who are going to compete on the national team. Yes, that's such a good one for athletes. It, it, it's you got to be flexible. Important. It shouldn't. The judging should not occur as an extension of your line of work. So if it's one of your job duties, you're just doing it because it's your duty, not because you were selected for it. So just keep that in mind, right? So a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm I'm the. I don't know, I'm the department director and I'm judging their work. I'm like, ah, yes, you are. And by, your, by definition, you are. But immig the immigrants, um, sorry, immigration's expectation is that you're not doing it because you're paid to do so kind of thing. The other thing that I want to point out is invitation to judge is not sufficient. You actually had to participate as a judge. So if they're inviting you to judge next year, we have to wait until you actually do it. Important part there. Absolutely. Let's uh, talk a little bit about membership because Go for it. this is this is such a, I'm not gonna say it's an easy category, it's an interesting category because a lot there's a lot put into this category. So you have to be a member of an association within your field that's easy. Selected for membership due to some sort of uh, achievement, reputable achievements, as judged by experts within your field. So those last two prongs are a little tricky. You know, what am I? Be why was I selected for membership, and whom selected me? Those are the two big questions the officer is going to ask. So if you paid to be a member, not enough. I'm a member of the bar. I am a member, I'm, a, I'm required to be a member of the bar in order to be an active attorney. Guess what? That wouldn't fly under this criterion for an EB1A. Other visa categories, yes. EB1A, no, there's a higher standard. You're self-petitioning. So we really want to set the bar. We really want to document it. Maybe there are three levels of membership and you're in the highest level of membership that did require an extra umph, right? Some, th some form of success on your part and there's a panel of people who have to make that evaluation to confirm you did receive uh, that kind of recognition and therefore you receive this esteemed level of membership within the organization let's document that what are the bylaws uh let's get a letter usually that helps explain all of this uh if there's a five member panel maybe let's get the bio on two people confirm that they are experts we really want to shore up with with evidence documenting why you were selected for membership why is that considered important within your industry exactly exactly the levels of membership is a really big one um they're gonna say like oh like regular members and then in order to hit the next level you have to show that really you have uh you know you're one of the top in your industry or you are really well known for what you do absolutely and and maybe something here that that helps too is sometimes being a member of something automatically will qualify but it's the membership to member of the olympic team because mm -hmm. that in and of itself is 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 already as high as you can get 
it's assumed that there's a process for that. So there are exceptions, but they're far and few in between. The idea is let's get this documented. I think there was Alexis, a I'm tossing up a question for you. Oh, here we go. So Karina Ramos asks, hi, Karina. What about national honor societies for students? That wouldn't be one. Now, if you told me you're a esteemed member of, uh, of the National Honor Society for student selecting students who are going to become members. And so now you're a member of the judging committee. Could there be an argument? I think it's still a stretch, but I could see it. Are you selecting them due to some sort of, so you're on the judging uh, committee and you're selecting, I don't know, some sort of award recipient or scholarship recipient, you know, Rhodes Scholar. Maybe, you know, I'm, I'm thinking very na internationally recognized and reputable scholarships at that point. It depends. But if you're thinking National Honor Society or traditional in and of itself, I would say no. If there's some sort of, you know, I'm, I'm throwing things out there. If there's some sort of National Honor Society for professionals, I don't know if that's a thing. I think it might have a different name. But if it's, yeah, it's already for professionals in the industry, then that could count. But the issue we're having there is with the student elements. Yeah. I feel like in the fields of science, there are several associations yeah. and societies. And, and when I think levels of membership, it's usually there. That's where my mind goes to. Anytime I've worked on a case where the person has, uh, and the case is focused in the field of science, usually, sometimes business, but very much so in the field of science, that's where that comes up where what are the levels of membership so an honor society yes something for professionals sure but it's really what is the level so uh, you know what's your role in there as well that that's really going to determine it if not um we simply skip it because we never want to lessen um your profile we, we don't want to take away from your strong points uh, now if, if there's an argued argument to be had we'll make it but if it's, if it's not that strong, why push it? Because there are other categories, and, and I guess we're going to get to them now, that we can argue to really show that, that, that it's important. And, and, and we don't want to take away. So, you know, think of levels of membership and, and what your role is in that level of membership when determining if you qualify under that uh, criteria. Yep. All right. So... We're going to get a little more specific. There are really, if we're being honest, some categories that do lend well to certain professions more than others. Yeah. Authorship is one of those, right? Authorship is you have authored, written scholarly articles in the field in professional or major trade publications. What does that mean? I have written articles. I've been an author or a co-author on articles. And the articles are being read by people in my industry in order to learn. And typically they're being published in, you know, medical journals, scholarly journals, professional journals. Now we've done the argument and sometimes we win and sometimes we lose where it's like, it's something a little different and I'll go into there first, but let me go to who this targets mainly. Let's go to the traditional. Let's go to the traditional. Traditional one is going to be, um, individual, sorry, let me hide the comment. Uh, the traditional one is going to be people in sciences, in education, that are writing articles as an author or a co-author in actual journals that are professional journals, medical journals, uh, law journals, investigative journals, research journals, all of those. That's the very typical one. I'm writing articles that mean to inform other people in my industry. That's traditional. Non-traditional that we've argued and we have had success is there is a publication that is um, teaching music, right? And it's the musician and he's writing articles on how like, listen, this is what you can do um, with these certain instruments in order to, you know, get this certain sound in order to hit this certain genre. So, and also we've actually tossed in classes in here. So even though it's not a written form, the argument that we kind of make is we say, hey, listen, um, this person taught music classes to professionals at, at an orchestra level and they're teaching other people in their industry, this is equivalent or akin to authorship. It doesn't always work, but we try. That's that's why we're creative and I think that's why we're very successful. We try a lot of things. I mean, something with the traditional form of authorship, um, if we're thinking anyone who's, who's done research-based work, uh, 
what are we looking for? How can we document this? One, you have the article was published. Okay. Is that publication reputable in the field? There's so many scientific journals. It's insane. Uh, and for good cause, honestly. Uh, there are many specialties. So we want to establish, was is the article highly circulated? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. Is the publication highly circulated? Who's the publisher? So those are things that I'm going to argue. So maybe the article is published in, let's just say, uh, X countries, um, ophthalmology magazine, just to continue to use that example. And that magazine, maybe the article when it was published, didn't get a lot of circulation, but the magazine is held, or the publication, I should say, is held by various journals uh, so, uh, or libraries across the United States or the world. So maybe they don't request every publication, you know, if it's quarterly, if it's printed monthly. Um, maybe they only did it, uh, I don't know, they were cycled in for about two years receiving the publication, then they stopped. But at some point, an esteemed university held that publication. Maybe not the one with the article, but the publication. So it gives the publication merit. Basically, I'm trying to establish that it's recognized in the field. It's certainly scholarly in nature, because why else would top libraries in the United States at, at esteemed universities hold that publication if it, if it wasn't important for some reason? Who's the publisher? I mean, lots of times those publishers are some of the most recognized in their fields. They're ones in, that are maybe more reputable across the world. Some are reputable to a specific country. That's okay. Let's make that argument. But I love what Stephanie brought up at the end, which is how we get creative. What if your field doesn't lend itself to this scholarly research and, and publication? Well, there's an argument to be had that serving as a teacher and teaching other professionals, right? I don't want to teach five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, but other professionals, maybe university level, there's an argument that we can make. Teaching them is a way of doing scholarly work. It's just hands-on. Uh, I have I had an athlete who created a certain way of uh, hooking and reeling fish. I know it sounds a, a little bit out there when I compare it to someone who's doing research, let's say, on cancer. <laughs> this person did create um, or, or maybe expanded the use of a specific technique. And I totally and, remember this too. And, and but it, it's it it everyone in the industry was raving about it, enjoyed it. Uh, he went to many conferences, spoke about it, taught others, and therefore. Within that industry, it's extremely reputable at the international level. So I use it for twofold, original contribution and authorship through teaching. And so sometimes we can get creative. We just need to know when is it worth stretching the argument and when is it not. Bingo. All righty, let's go to another category that does tend to lead itself um, very much so to a certain career, right? Dis uh, no, excuse me, I wanted to talk about, yes, display. Display in artistic exhibitions or showcases. So traditionally, and if you read the policy manual, you read the case law, traditionally, this is for painters and artists who are exhibiting their work in some sort of gallery, right? So my work is on display at an artistic exhibition or showcase. Um, just a note there, if you are an artist and you're trying to move on EB1 and you're trying to document your case, immigration is going to look far more favorably upon individual gallery exhibitions and individual collections versus collective exhibitions. So if you have an opportunity, make sure you have an individual exhibition of your artwork in some sort of gallery, some sort of public space. This is going to be very useful for the display category for USCIS. Now, we have used this category almost as a catch-all a little bit. Uh, we've used it in other types of ways. And I have argued, for instance, that an artist is putting his work on display at an athletic exhibition when he's participating at the Pan American Games. 
We have argued that a musician is putting his music on display when he is on stage at Lollapalooza or some sort of major music festival. Um, it's We have argued that a chef is putting his work on display when he's participating at some sort of chef exhibition, right? So they have sometimes the culinary industry has like these exhibitions and these culinary festivals. And there are chefs that are actually there cooking in front of you. I'm putting my work on display at an artistic exhibition. It, as long as your work is on display for the public, there is an argument I would say to be made. Absolutely. And, and, and to keep it brief, because the case law does limit display to the arts, but there's an 11th category and it's more of a- Now we're throwing everybody off. It's other comparable. Yes. And that gives us the right to maybe use the categories that are already there and and make these creative arguments. We still have to argue why some of the other categories don't neatly apply. Uh, and so that's when our legal work really kicks in. I feel like there is a level of discretion there provided to the officer. Uh, but that gives us creative license. Yeah, creative license to really go in there and and make those arguments, you know, conference speaker. I mean, if you've spoken at 20, 30, 40 wow. conferences, maybe it's worth making that argument. Uh, maybe not. It really depends on the case. Yeah. I mean, another one that's usually limited to the arts, Stephanie, is uh, commercial success, right? So, yes, you know, that, that that's the performing arts and, and it's all about numbers. Mm -hmm. How many views, how many tickets were sold? How much money was made at the box office? I mean, the, the law really gets into it and, and the policy manual emphasizes that. But it's good to know that, I mean, what else is commercial success? Because the category is commercial success in the performing arts, right? In the performing arts. So what's a performing art? So, you know, starting with the arts. Well, if you're a musician and you have a YouTube video, is that the performing arts? Maybe by definition, no. But can we explain how it could be? how it's relevant. Um, if you have a set number of downloads on Spotify, mm -hmm. on SoundCloud, I think we could make the argument. Um, guess what? If you're the producer of commercials and these commercials are for Fortune 500 companies, so let's say, you know, automobile companies. I, I'm using this as an example, it happened to me. And Lexus and Toyota and Ford, but those commercials really attract a lot of people to come in and, and buy it. Would I extend myself to say that the revenue that company makes and the billions of dollars that a little bit is attributed to the commercials this person is producing? I might make the argument if I'm feeling uh, good about the case that day, depending <laughs> what the climate's like on EB1s at the moment. I've made it before, case approved. I'm not going to say it's just because of that. Obviously, that's a winner case, but there's a little bit of creativity as well. And that's where the other comparable comes in. Uh, but we can't stretch it too much. OK, if 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 you have a product, you created this product, you sold a thousand of these products. I mean, is that commercial success? Maybe not. Have you generated ten thousand dollars worth of revenue? No. A hundred thousand? Maybe not. Right. We have to we have to compare you to the big wigs. Because extraordinary ability, I mean, put yourself, your top 10, mm -hmm. top, you know, top 1%, you know, I'm willing to stretch a little bit within your field. We got to keep you in mind. Don't scare the people. There's ways. We could get creative. I know. I know. We always get creative. That's why. I yeah, you're underselling yourself. Am I? I guess I am. All righty. Um, here's another one that typically, again, is sort of for the arts, but we have used it in many other ways, which is original contributions. So the idea is you've made an original contribution to the field and important words, it is of major significance. So typically we'll plug in patents here, patents, trademark, trademarks, copyrights, anything that you've done. I know it says the word artistic, but we have been successful in doing it for other types of careers like businesses, sciences, education, um, excuse me, uh, entrepreneurs, athletes, musicians, things like that. So the idea is original contribution is I made something. So Alexis was talking about his example, which was essentially someone who was in the fishing industry and he created this technique on how to reel in a fish and everyone was using it. He has letters from people saying, no, that is it. There was a press article that talked about how that was it. That was the technique to use. Um, 
And that was how we showed original contribution. Others that we have shown, for instance, um, I had one that was interesting. Oh, I remember. It was a guy who created a sort of packaging for bananas. And the way you packaged it would make the banana last longer. It wouldn't ripen as quickly. So that was an original contribution. And he got letters from all these distributors that distribute and, and transport bananas. And they were like, yeah, thankfully, this thing that he created is great because it's helped all of our businesses. That's an original contribution of major significance. Um, we had the guy that made like something, something different about the in-ear monitor for musicians. He did something to the in-ear monitor for musicians that changed the game. And we were able, and that was just a musician. That wasn't a guy who was actually dedicated to that. He just made some sort of tweak to it. And a lot of musicians were like, oh, this was such a great tweak. Examples of original, original contributions there. See, the big thing there, it, it, you, you mentioned it there, it's that people started using it. So it has to have a uh, major significance. So if you only have a patent, but nothing's really come out of it, it's debatable. Uh, though we're still going to make the argument. But ideally, I, I even find it better, even if you don't have a patent, but if there are experts within the field, so we're going to provide evidence to show that these people, we're going to write these letters confirming that your work or what you've created, your technique is original, is an original contribution to the field. That's what we need. Experts are acknowledging this. Maybe there's press articles about it, you know, ideally, but not always. But if we could get experts to say, hey, these techniques are widely used, how they're used, that's that's what matters. Uh, and, and again, it could be something technical in, in, in music, in the field of music. It could be something as technical as stuff you said in the business world. You know the, the transportation of, of produce there's so many ways to argue original contribution but we do need to emphasize that that major significance if, if it's just something you've registered it's going to be a little bit of a stretch you know i just have a copyright on my name i mean uh beltran Brito logo will have a copyright right that's not an original contribution to the field of law so it, it, you we have to be mindful of that as well um, but it's definitely a unique criterion or category that the immigration has and how to document it is the most important thing. And Alexis, I am going to correct myself. You're completely right. I was mixing it with display. Uh, so original contribution is applicable to everybody. It is artistic related contributions, athletic, uh, business related, scholarly related. So any original contribution in any field qualifies for this. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, so that, that's a good one that opens up to many uh, different people and, and, and different areas. I mean, one that I really like is, and I want to get this one out of the way, is salary. Showing that, demonstrating that you've earned a salary that is significantly high compared to others in your field and within your country. So if, if you're in, uh, I don't know, Let's say the Bahamas. Oh, that's a that's a unique, very unique one. Let's say you're in Argentina. I'm not going to use the Argentine peso and compare it to the U.S. dollar. I'm yeah. going to use people within your field. If you're in Canada, we're going to come and you earn the money in Canada. We'll compare it to Canadians. Now, if you were in the U.S., we're going to compare it to other people in the U.S. Exactly. New, well, not as new, but something that changed uh, not so long ago is. If you can command said salary, you will earn a high salary. That it's can so also so much be easier hard. to prove. Well, if you got the contract from a company <laughs> and they're saying it, and you know, uh, we can document this is a legitimate contract. That's or offer, right? Because it is a future contract, uh, future offer. Then yeah, we can make the argument. I really like it. I mean. Many of our clients already met that criterion before. And by the way, there's 10 criterion, 11 of you come other comparable, but please know we only need to meet three. That doesn't mean I'm going to argue three only or argue as many great or good categories as possible. So maybe we have evidence for eight, but only six are really strong. You know, maybe that commercial success, it just really isn't high. Let's not push it. Let's focus on the great ones because, again, it's extraordinary ability. I don't want to make you exceptional. I don't want to make you great. I got to sell you. Extraordinary. You've done the work. Let us do now ours. Let us interpret that for the USCIS officer. 
And And I I mentioned this, Alexis, but I kind of want to just hammer this point home because a lot of people have this question and they confuse it. You have to earn a high salary in comparison to others in the same field. So I've had a lot of people say, yeah, I earn a lot in Germany. I do. Yeah, but do you earn a lot in comparison to other musicians? Do you earn a lot in comparison to other uh, orthodontists? It has to be specific, exactly specific to what you do. Absolutely. So you could work in the field of business, but if you're a director, I can't compare you to, uh, I don't know, uh, an entry level position or vice, you know, it's got to be apples for apples kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, and, by, and by the way, these achievements, these recognitions, the membership, the press, they could be from your home country, maybe a country you frequent, the United States. It doesn't need to be one location. It certainly doesn't need to be in the U.S., Again, when we say nationally recognized, we mean your home country, wherever you're based out of. So if, if you've worked in, uh, let's say, uh, Germany, Australia, and China, guess what? Then those are the comparables. And if you earn the income in one and it was the high income, well, we're going to compare it to where you earn that income and, and people who've held or hold a similar title within that country. Uh, and, and the membership, many times people are very, I mean, they're experts in their field. So they'll be a member yeah, in their home country, but they're also a member of the international version of that association. That's great. Or they're a musician and they go on tour and there's press about them in several countries. They might not even speak the language, but there's press about it. It's legitimate. Athletes happens all the time. Um, that's okay. That's okay. We can use that. We're not limited. Uh, by that. Um, I Last but not least, Stephanie, I think lead and critical. I mean, it's we leave the hardest for last always. Not the hardest. It's the best one. It's the one I think that everyone should argue. I, I really think so. I know it's, it's, there have been one or two cases where I haven't argued this category, but this is sort of like the one where you get to show who you are and what you do. So the category specifically, word for word, is that you have had a lead, starring, or critical role. No, right? Yes. No. Critical, lead or critical. I'm thinking, oh, one land. Leading or critical role for organizations or establishments that are distinguished. What does that translate to? That you have an important role in a company or in an organization or some sort of entity. I love here... And this is going to go across the board. I think we're going to have a ton of examples for this. But it's important to show that your role was high. That's one of the major points here. So if you have, for instance, an organizational chart, you are towards the top in some sort of business setting or scientific setting. You are towards the top. Towards the top. Excuse me. If you are in um, the arts or motion picture television, you are the face that's on the film poster. You are coming out towards the top of your spotlight profile or the IMD profile for the film or for the production. The film festival usually is going to say like the names of the people, but they're not going to name every single actor. Your name is there, right? Um, For And behind the scenes, this works too. You are the director. You're not the assistant director. You are the producer. You're not the assistant producer. You are the main head person on this project. Or, or, or that area within the production, right? So thinking, so you, maybe you're not a starring actor, but you're part of the main cast, right? Or you're a recurring actor. It, it, thinking of it like a TV show, mm-hmm. right? Um, maybe you're a sound engineer, but, but your role is you're creating all of the, the music and editing, yeah. the post pre-production, uh, sorry, production and post-production of that audio so you have a, a very important role within the department and, and when that step of the creation of the final product. So I don't want to limit you as either. And, and I know Stephanie's not doing that, but I just want to expand. There's so many ways someone can play a lead and critical role uh, and, and or even qualify for an EV1 for that matter. So you could be the sound engineer. You might be the lighting uh, director. OK, I know assistant directors, that's. That's a unique one because assistant directors do so much. And and I know how valuable they are for the film industry. USCIS is on the fence about it. Yeah. And we've had really good people approved and some that have, you know, requests for evidence and we've really had to fight tooth and nail. Uh, So I understand. But 
going off easy examples, yes, you want to be the director. You want to be the producer. You want to be at the top of that charter as close as you can be. Uh, we want to show that your role is important. And then at the same time that the organization is distinguished. I'm gonna, before you go into organization distinguished, that's an excellent point here. Um, producers, directors, the, the issues that we've had with USCIS. Yeah. What I have found in my experience is that they like titles like associate producer, like executive producer, like um, casting producer. They like those titles and they tend to shy away from the one that's assistant, even though sometimes the assistant producer is higher on the totem pole than the associate producer. Something about someone who's not in the entertainment industry, something about the word assistant makes them think the person who gets the coffee, right? So if you have an associate producer role, I feel really, really nice about that. If you have an assistant producer role, it is gonna be a little tougher. So. Keep that in mind when you're negotiating your credits on your future productions and they're like, hey, we want to give you a, an assistant production nod. Hey, can you write associate instead? Like it's just it's a simple thing of language, but it's going to help your case. It's so funny because in the banking industry, there everyone's an executive or vice president. And really, it's just almost an entry level position. Uh, but then you, in the film industry, you have assistant director and wow is it such an important role right uh it's, it's it's bizarre but we help explain that that's part of what we're doing and and then to kind of proceed with that because we have a lot of questions we, we want to get to but the the distinguished nature of the organization is very important mm -hmm. so if you were the director of a film that you posted on youtube and it has a thousand views not as great as one where maybe you're the uh, I don't know, maybe the sound designer of, I don't know, a, a top film or a TV show. A film that went to a bunch of film festivals. Exactly. Exactly. It, so you, you really have to take that into consideration. Maybe most of the recognition and that you've had in your field so far is as a sound designer. You're dabbling into in production or direction, and but you just don't have the credits yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the press isn't there yet. That's fine. Sound designers are important too. You may have an extraordinary ability as a sound designer. Let's focus in on that. And I'm just using that as an example. That applies to, to any field, any criteria. So having a conversation with, with us is so important at the onset because we're talking half an hour and we're trying to figure out what have you done? What's the title going to be? And if you're almost there, you're the cusp at it of, of, of becoming what we're going to consider extraordinary. Let's give you, and by USCIS standards, by the way, let's give you a little bit of homework. Maybe in I, give, I give so much homework. <laughs> yeah. I, I tell people all the time, all do these three things. It's going to take three it. months. Come back. We're going to win this case. Yeah. Let's just do it. By the way, you're already on the trajectory. So why not just do what's needed? Not because you're not successful but it's because what immigration wants you to do. Right. That's that's what's going on here. We're we're filling a frame set by immigration, not a person who's an expert in your field, and we just need to make it work in that way. And you know, I just thought of this earlier. The first category we talked about was press. Remember how I said, if the press is about you, it goes into the press category, but if the press is not really about you, but it's on something you worked on and it mentions you, or it's just something about your project, that's where here is where it comes in. Oh, lead and so critical. Exactly. So if I have a distinguished organization or establishment or a distinguished uh, film project that I worked on. Here's where it comes. So in my earlier example, if the press is about the tennis federation and you were playing for them, but the ten it's about the it's about their participation at the contest. It's about like how the national team of Canada did at the tennis federation. That goes well because it's OK. It's an article that shows how the Federation of Tennis of Canada is really good. Or if you have some sort of press article where it's just generally about the film itself, wow, Titanic made a, a, a you know amazing job at the box office, then that's where I plug that in. So that press is useful that it's about your work, but I'm going to use it somewhere else. Exactly. Exactly. So it's not to say that just because it doesn't fit neatly in one category it can't be used for another. You know, let us make that determination. Exactly. Honestly. And to that point, give us everything. Let, let us figure out what to include and not to include. I swear to God, I can't tell you the amount of times that we get to an RFP stage and my client's like, 
oh, here, I never gave you this. And I'm like, why? <laughs> why did you never give me that? Give Absolutely. us everything. Absolutely. And then let us determine what to include and what to exclude. Yeah. That's why I like reviewing everything digitally now. I tell a lot of clients, open up uh, on Google Drive, create a folder with your name in there, you know, just to keep it somewhat neat different categories that apply. So if you have some press, put it in the press folder. If you have some letters, put in the letters for it. Let's review all that together. Give me everything. Let me tell you what to remove. That way we're left with everything that we need. You send it over. It's nice and neat. Yeah, it's such a great time. But uh, we have some good questions to get to. I mean, uh, I think there's one here. Let's start with this person. Uh, Danny Dandy Gosling from Mexico. Hi, Dandy. If I'm a university tennis player from a university in Mexico, can I attain an EB1? I have multiple achievements at the national level since I was really young or little, and I am uh, Mexican. I live in Mexico. Maybe, probably. Uh, we let's see what that evidence is. Knowing how the sport is uh, of tennis and how it works in, in in really all the countries, even at the university level, you're playing as a professional. Mm -hmm. And so if you're competing also in professional competitions sponsored by uh, the Mex Mexican Association of Tennis, or there you go. That's what matters. Now, if, you know, if it's between high schools, not really, but even at a young age, you're competing at a professional level, that's a trajectory we want to see. You probably have some sort of ranking at this point. Mm -hmm. You have press. Uh, you probably have some awards. Uh, depending how much success you have, maybe we can argue membership. Those are just four off the back automatically. I have, haven't seen your profile or the details of your profile, but that are generally there. We've worked so many of these cases, Stephanie. We, we know what we want to look for. I also like here um, suggesting that if you have a good relationship with the Federation, ask them if you could, hey, can you have me on like a panel that helps to choose who's going to the Olympics or who's going to be... Um, moved up from the junior level to the uh, professional level. If you can help judge or evaluate other players and the federation in Mexico, the federation in your home state can verify, yeah, he helped us in choosing who was going to be uh, sent to this the Pan American Games, then you've got the judging category too. Absolutely. Dandy, send us your resume. We got, we got to see that. You know what's also good to mention here that we've done before, I think it's worth mentioning. Let's say you had an earlier career as the tennis player but you are now a tennis coach. Yeah. We, Alexis, look at, look at your face. Your face said it all. We've done it. We know exactly how to do it. There is a way to sell this. Um, this is like top private information. So we're not going to give you the title we give them, but there is a way to sell it where we essentially show that's a logical progression in your career that you were a player and now you're a coach. So that means you're at the top because that's the normal progression of the career. And then, coach so you can use both your your athletic work and your coaching work there is a way to do that just in case you're watching and and that applies to you yeah it's an exceptions usually limited uh, to well it is limited to the field of athletics right mm -hmm. it's that progression just just to make it clear because a lot of people are going to say well you know i started at the bottom now i'm here <laughs> but uh we you know we can't use all of that right we can't it's just a good idea because sometimes people will disqualify themselves and say, man, but I'm not playing anymore. Yeah, but you're coaching now and you're part of the federation and you're helping uh, the new generation of athletes. We've done it for golfing. We've done it for tennis. We've done it for uh, domino. <laughs> we've done it for poker. We've done it for a lot. So there is a way. Don't. I guess what I mean to say is don't disqualify yourself. Let us disqualify you. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. People have no idea. Exactly. Let us say no. Mm -hmm. Don't say, don't tell yourself no. Exactly. Um, a few other questions. So minimum docu uh, documentary requirements for an EB1A. I mean, we want to really establish and support uh, the arguments we're making. So we need evidence of that. I think we've gone into that today. Aside from that, you have the forms, G28, I-140. You have the fees. Uh, recently went up $715 for an I-140. There's a, a supplemental uh, uh, program fee now of either 300 or 600, but it's EB1A, self-petitioner, automatically 300. Um, aside from that, you want to provide maybe a letter of interest, right? Mm -hmm. Just to kind of establish it's a letter from yourself, kind of saying what you plan to do in the United States. We want to establish that all the great things you've done, 
you intend to do in the United States, right? You want to continue that. Uh, we also want to provide job offers if you have those interest letters. It doesn't have to be a flat out job offer, but rather a letter of interest. Uh, someone who is willing or a company organization willing to work with you. Um, things could change, right? It's, it's very informal. And uh, I always like to provide, if it's possible, a couple expert letters, uh, let's say substantial benefit letters from people in the United States that maybe have never worked with you, but can really talk about your work and qualify you and your success. Uh, I've got a question from Eje Gital. Is there an equivalent temporary visa option, the O-1 visa? The O-1 visa is going to be, okay, let's talk about the person who is not at the very, very top yet, but they're getting there. They've done a little bit in their career. Maybe they don't have five press articles, but they have two. Maybe they don't have awards, but they have a nomination. Maybe they have, um, you know, they, they've done a little bit. They're not fully there yet. O-1 visa. O-1 visa, very logical progression in the, to lead to an EB-1. A lot of people do the O-1 visa first before the EB-1. O-1 visa is a temporary visa for those with extraordinary abilities, and it has a duration of three years. So actually, and if this doesn't bother you, I'm going to jump to another question because I was a little confused by this question, but I think I know what they're getting at. What is the three-year rule for EB-1? There's no such thing as a three-year rule for an EB-1, okay? But what I think you might be saying is, because some attorneys sometimes say this, is you're going to do an O-1 before your EB-1. That is a misconception. You do not have to do a three-year O-1 in order to apply for an EB-1. You can go directly to an EB-1. You can also, if you're here on an O-1, you don't have to wait till your last year of the O-1 to apply. Any attorney that's telling you that is because they want to charge you twice, mm -hmm. right? You can start the EB-1 simultaneously with the O-1. You can start it immediately after getting the O-1. We've had clients that have an O-1 for 20 years, and then they decide to do an EB-1. So no three-year rule. I was trying to think, is there anything else that occurs to you when he's talking about? No, right? It has to no. be that. I'm assuming it's that. And, and, and honestly, I agree with Stephanie. You don't have to do the O-1. Are there reasons to do it versus the EB-1? Sure. Uh, there are tax reasons, tax right. accountant, uh, timing reasons, and no one's much faster obtained because the EB-1 are, are two steps. After you get the EB-1, I-140 approved, you got to file for adjustment of status. Currently, that's taking a year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. O-1, as soon as you're approved, you're, in, you're coming to the United States or you're okay. changing status. Uh, also, O-1, the, though the categories are similar, the level of maybe review by that officer is a little less. So it's a little bit easier to do than an EB-1. Of course, you're getting a green card. Exactly. You're to become a legal permanent resident. The threshold is much higher. So, you know, there are reasons to do an EB-1 first. Uh, but when someone qualifies, I tell them flat out, you have two visas. If you want to do the EB-1 and you don't have any other restriction, let's go for it. I mean, I lose out on it a little bit, but why? Why would I do that to you? You know, that's Let's just get you the EB-1. So it really depends. But I have clients all the time who say, no, I'm, I'm in the United States. I need to get off my H-1B immediately. Let's get you in that O-1. Once you're in the O-1, we have a base for that EB-1. We we kind of update it. We get where we ne need to go. And within 12 months, we already have the EB-1 approved, green card in hand, and and they and that's it. They're no longer on the O-1. So it really depends. It's, that's already part of strategy more than anything. I'm going to drop something here. And if you're listening only for EB-1, shut your ears so you don't get confused. They might be referring to the three-year rule for a multinational manager or executive, like the next step up from an L1, basically. Oh, an EB-1B? EB-1C. EB so we're talking, let's be clear, we're talking about EB-1A today, which is extraordinary ability. EB-1C, basically, it's this whole thing where you've been employed outside of the U.S. for at least one year in the three years preceding. Maybe that's what he's referring to by the three-year rule. Mm -hmm. Don't get confused. That's an EB-1C. It's a completely, completely, fully different type of case. Yeah, there's so there's EB-1A, extraordinary ability. Then you have... EB-1B, which is uh, outstanding professors or researchers, and then EB-1C, uh, which is the multinational, I think it's managers, executives, uh, if, if I'm not misquoting. And, and so the, there are no, there are differences within the three. Big differences. Uh, um, EB-1B and EB-1C, the benefits there are you do not have to go through the PERM process, the labor certification process. 
you still have an entity that's petitioning for you, but your skills are so great and the role that you play is so great that you you skip that part. So it's a, they're really good options. Uh, we love them. Harder to come by though. And it's not self-petitioned. Not self-petitioned, absolutely. Not like the ED1A, which is the one we're talking about, yeah, no. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Juan Gomez asks, how should the evidence be organized? It really depends. I mean, there's not one way to, you know, crack a nut, but I'd say the way we do it is pretty successful. You kind of do it by category and you want to break down the elements and, and you really want to make sure you're addressing each concern that officer is going to have. All righty. I'm going to go with uh, painting with JS. What about a painting career? All right. So actually I got one approved this week. Painter. Painter is usually going to be might have awards. Maybe you have an awards for like uh, best art at the Cohen and Grove Arts Festival or best whatever, best artwork, best uh, painting, best black and white work, something like that. Maybe you have an award, not necessary. I do want press. I do want a press article that talked about your gallery exhibition. I do want an interview with you. I do want um, a press article that says, uh, for instance, this guy that just won, like he's making changes in the art world because he's um, using his artwork to show shine a light on Alzheimer's. That was the one I just won now. So that was press, right? For a painting career, I also want display what I was mentioning earlier. Try and do an individual exhibition versus a collective exhibition. I'm gonna include your collectives, but immigration is going to give more weight to your individuals. By the way, and this is like, I hope immigration never watches these videos. You can organize this yourself, right? This could be your own individual collection, your own individual gallery exhibition. It doesn't have to be organized by someone else. You can do it yourself. Okay. Um, maybe get some press about that event. I mean, uh, galleries, working with galleries. Yeah. I mean, that happens all the time. Uh, you're, you're selling your work through a gallery. The gallery's role is to really make that work popular. I mean, it's a win-win for everyone that it naturally occurs. There's nothing wrong in that. That's, that's normal for the industry. So keep the brochures for the gallery events. Absolutely. Um, okay. Lead and critical. Here's one that we've done for an artist. They did like a collaboration with a scooter brand mm -hmm. and it was his artwork would come out on the scooter. So there's a way to do, I have an important role, a leading or critical role, for a distinguished organization. Hey, for the for the artist line of this watch, we did it for watch too. If the artist line for this watch or the artist line for this scooter, I was the artist who made that line. That can work as well. Any other ideas for artists? Judging an art competition. Oh yeah. Judging yeah. an art competition. Get it for me, please. I beg you. Um, ideally not young students, could be older university level students or professionals, but judging some sort of art competition. Yeah, I mean, and and if you really are turning out really high sales in your art, um, usually you're going to want to document that. And it, it could be a little bit tricky because there are many ways that you receive payment, but then you file taxes at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And and if it's delineated how much of your income, right, there are many sources of income, maybe you're more than just an artist, but if we can confirm how much of that is due to your work, the sales of your artwork, maybe you have a high salary. Or maybe there's uh, someone who's sending a very lucrative contract your way for some art you're going to create for them. And then that's future salary that, that can be argued, honestly. Um, Isabella Garcia has a couple great questions, honestly. And she asks, what if I have only one publication, uh, but I've been a judge in, at, at academic competitions uh, for my specialty for many years? Do you think that this lack of publications can be compensated? Thanks. If you only have one publication, I'm not really going to include it. I'm including it. Yes. No. Get out of here. She has one copy. There is not. Okay. Me and Alexis are going to. Uh, 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 and I know you've done it too, which is the funniest part. I know you've included one article. Here's the thing. Immigration, the categories might say plural, might say you have to have more than one, but the law explicitly states that you do not. So if I have one authorship article, you're gonna, of course you're going to include it. I'm, I, 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 let me eat my words a bit. <laughs> I knew I'm it. assuming that she did it as part of like her bachelor's or master's, like a thesis, and it wasn't highly published. That's uh, but you're assuming. But yes. I will say before making the decision, I want to review and know where was it published yeah. to see if it's worth it. Can it be compensated? Uh, that's interesting. I mean, 
we can consider authorship. Uh, I mean, was the work tied to some sort of major media or a trade publication? So maybe it's not at the scientific level, but you're writing for, um, let's not say a, a blog per se, but a, an industry magazine that we can include too. So if you have that, I think that's a way of compensating. And usually if, if you have this theoretical component of your career where you're, you're working as a judge and doing publications, you have probably authored works that aren't research-based, but you, you've you published them in, in, in these trade publications. We can include that there as well. So, you know, that's why. Don't withhold. Ask these good questions. Let's review it. I promise I ask all the questions as well to make sure we're including what we need. Anymore. Yeah. I think if it's like, I agree with Alexis, if you only authored your thesis work, maybe I'm not going to, maybe it's not that great because you have to do it as part of school, right? I, I just don't want to take away from all the other good things you've done. Right. But maybe you authored just one. It happened to be your thesis work, but then it got picked up by the medical journal of XX mm -hmm. and you were an author in a professional journal. Or maybe you authored just one, but it did come out in the journal of your industry. For me, that's sufficient. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I guess we get, let's do a couple more questions and then we got to wrap this up. Uh, I do want to say, you know, so Rodrigo asks, Rodrigo Segnini, what about an award not central to the endeavor presented in the B1 application? It goes again, how, how far removed are they? So if one is an award as a chef, but your career is as an athlete, not going to include it mm -hmm. or vice versa. So we, we got to find some sort of relation. Yeah, agree. Absolutely agree. All right. Um, Eris Mendy, what about the person is a teacher at the university, principal in the department of thesis and thesis degree, thesis um, assessor, um, evaluator, uh, or, or teacher? No. What do you say that in English? I know what you're talking about. They're reviewing. Uh, yeah. They're thesis. They do Actual, thesis. If we're currently a PhD student. Okay. So what you're going to want to do is I'm going to show both. I'm going to show that you're a university level professor. I could probably plug that into lead and critical role. Um, and I'm also going to show that, especially if you're the head of the department, if you're the principal of the department, I'm going to have an organizational chart of the department that shows that you're the head of the department. Great for lead and critical role. Then the uh, thesis assessor, I want the university to say that as the thesis assessor, he is judging individual works of our uh, students and he's evaluating the work of our students. You're hitting two categories. It works great. I want to know what's your specialty because I'm not going to call you teacher, I'm not going to call you professor. I want to know what your specialty is that, you know, what's your ology. And that's really how, how we would develop an EB1A because it's got to be an extraordinary ability within your field. Now, if your role is teaching other teachers, so if you're an education expert, then, you know, that's a route. So, but that's very important too. Um, I think, I think we might have gotten everything. Andres asked in Spanish, hola, abogados, los logros. Uh, he says, hello, attorneys. Um, recognition received through uh, awards and other recognition presented for an EB1. Should they be awards received or recognition received in USA? Uh, he asked about this before. It does not. Someone else asked. It does not need to be, again, wherever you want it, wherever the recognition is from, wherever you worked, we're going to include it. Uh, we got a few shout outs here. Gallo Ortega, great webinar. Thank you, Gallo. I love you, Gallo. Eladio Rico, fancy seeing you here. Great program. It'll be useful, especially for employees who don't have ideas of this process. Thank you, Eladio. Nice hearing from you. Uh, I mean, this was actually a pretty good turnout, Stephanie. Yeah, this was really good. I think it's, um, you know, obviously we do a lot of content in Spanish. So if you like the content in English, please go ahead and let us know. Uh, Alexis and I are happy to continue doing it. So let us know if, you, if this is this kind of thing that interests you. Um, we could do future webinars in the future on O1s, on P1s, on EB2 and IW. We could do a lot of them. So tell us if you're interested. And um, I believe this program will be on our YouTube later. So you'll be able to watch it there. Um, thank you guys for everything. Rod tells us you guys are amazing. It's encouraging to listen your advice in these programs. Rod, uh, Alexis and I really, we get creative. Uh, you know, my hat's off to Alexis. He's incredibly creative. And um, 
I think that's why we're having such success. EB1 is something that I don't want you guys to leave here thinking it is only for Einstein. It is not. It could be mold and it could be molded to be made for everybody. It's a great type of petition. We love doing it. And um, if you guys have any questions, obviously you can contact us right here, beltramrito.com slash contact us. There it is. There it is. Remember, for every Einstein or Tesla, there's an Edison and everybody underneath much lower who's also extraordinary. So. Look, this is one of mine, Bernardo. He's <laughs> remember I said earlier that I give homework. I always give my people homework. Bernardo's doing his homework. Hi, Bernardo. So yes, do your homework and we will make a winning yeah. case. That's awesome. Well, wishing everybody a happy weekend uh, for those who are here with us live and we'll see you soon. Thank you guys. That's a wrap.